Welcome to Ozark First Assembly. We're so glad that you're here with us today. If this is your first time visiting, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. We hope that you feel at home here. We want to let you know about a few things coming up here at Ozark First Assembly. This year's egg hunt will be Saturday, April 16th. We need your help in making sure that we have enough eggs and candy. We're asking for plastic eggs and individually wrapped pieces of candy. There are boxes out front for you to drop them off in. Sign up at the Welcome Center to help us make this day a success. There will be a volunteer meeting this afternoon in the Kids Church at 4 p.m. for anyone interested in helping. Kids Camp is June 1st through the 4th. The cost is $140 per person. For more information, you can see Pastor Matt. We will be serving the Dothan Rescue Mission on Monday, April 4th. Join us at 515 to serve and at 6 o'clock for the worship service. Our Flying Solo Widows Ministry will meet at Hoppergrass for lunch this Wednesday at 11 o'clock. We have a new group coming to OFA for young families. Please stop by the table located in the foyer for more information and to sign your family up. We will also be having our first young family event on April 30th at the home of Caleb and Stephanie Dice. We hope to see you there. Fervent Women's Ministry will be hosting a paint party Thursday, April 21st from 6 o'clock to 8.30 in the Fellowship Hall. You will have a choice of two door hangers. You can see samples at the Welcome Center. The cost is $25 per person and is due by Wednesday, April 20th. You can see Julie Watley if you have any questions. Be sure to check us out on our website and our Facebook page for more information and to stay better connected. Again, thanks so much for being with us today. We're expecting a great service. 122 verse 1. I love what David writes here. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. What's interesting about this psalm is it is titled a song of ascent. Although David wrote it, this is titled a song of the ascent. So pilgrims would sing this song on their journey to Jerusalem for one of the three major festivals. It's attributed to David, and we know David, the scripture says, was a man who was after God's heart. That's where David, that's where his life was. And his great desire as a worshiper was to join with God's people and go to the place of God's abode, the tent, the tabernacle, that they could worship together there where God's presence was. What's interesting about this song is it was sung by the travelers and many had to travel days, weeks, even possibly months, probably within the week category. But they wouldn't sing in complaint and they wouldn't sing in distress. This song was to be sung in thanksgiving. We have many demands on our time, do we not? Come on, all of us. It doesn't matter who we are, everyone in the building, everyone watching online. We all have demands on our team. And sometimes coming to God's house and be with God's people, that can be complaint. Have you ever been there? I raise my hand. Come on. Can you raise your hand with me? There's been a complaint, a grumbling, a griping. Oh my goodness, I got to do here Sunday morning again. But that's not the way God intends for his people to gather together. Amen. How many of you like me have come in with a spirit of complaint and as soon as you began to worship, the spirit of God just grab a hold of you and you say, Lord, forgive me. God, thank you for letting me be in your presence. Thank you for letting me be among your people. Can we stand together? Aren't you thankful for that? We stand together. We've come this morning. And may we gather together and say as David said. And say as those pilgriming toward Jerusalem. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come on, lift your voice. And let's celebrate the Lord this morning. Father, we worship you. And we say as David has said, Oh, I was glad when they said unto me that we are able to gather together in your house and to worship you in the living faith that you have given us through your Son by the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, as we together lift our voices now and as the worshipers lead us, that we join with them in worship and become worshipers as we are, that, Lord, you would receive our praise as we give it wholehearted 
Father, in joyous celebration that we are, as your children, through faith in Christ, the temples of your presence. May we worship you in your grace and in your mercy and your character. Come on. Let's worship and magnify him wholeheartedly this morning in gladness and thanksgiving. John chapter, and as Jesus spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we humble our hearts before you. And we pray through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, that you would lead and guide us in your truth. And we would become bearers of your truth. Because our lives as your children are to bear the fruit of Holy Spirit. To bear the fruit of Christ. That this world may see and know that there is a living Savior, and His name is Jesus. That they can see the results from our lives of the work that you have begun, and you are faithfully continuing. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your glory and the advancement of your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are two words that we find throughout the gospel account of John. And they are both very important words to help us to understand John's intent through the leading of Holy Spirit in this gospel account. We know by tradition that this was the last of the four to be written. John has already written his epistle. And this is the last of the four gospel accounts to be written. The words that we find that help us to understand John's intent through the moving of Holy Spirit is the two words believe and truth. Believe and truth. We find them throughout this gospel. In fact, John tells us at the end in John 20 and verse 31 that he has written, he tells us very plainly that he has written these things to stir our hearts to believe in the truth. John tells us on this day, in fact, these are the individuals that we know that have been fed the fish and the loaves from the little boy's sack lunch. Over 5,000 people fed. They saw the miracle that God had done. Their, be- their bellies were full. And that's the amazing thing, possibly for the majority of them, if not all of them, they actually had a meal till they ate until they were full. How many of us have had that? Or how many of you, like me, have, should have stopped when we were full and then we regret eating more? And we pay for it that night. But they ate till they were full. These individuals are in the crowd. Some of those are, had sailed over where Jesus was, and Jesus saw them and even told them, hey, you haven't come to just hear the things that I've said. You came because you had your bellies full or filled. And he began to teach them in these words after he spoke. John says, some of them believed. And he tells us that in verse 30 that we've read, some of the Jews believed in Jesus. Believe is an important word. Therefore, it's important for us to understand the meaning of this word. Believe is translated to us in the English. Translated from a Greek word, and this word means to be persuaded in the truthfulness of. And it also carries the meaning to trust, to rely upon, to derive confidence in. So what comes to my mind is, why do we trust? Why do we derive confidence? Because that's what the word believe means. And John said that individuals there, some of the Jews, believed in Jesus. And John says, that's one of the reasons I've written this. It's the main reason I've written this and was led of the Lord to write this gospel account. It's so that it would stir your hearts to believe in the truth. 
Why are we persuaded? Why do we trust? Why do we rely? Why are we led in confidence? Because we are persuaded in the truthfulness of the object of our belief. Jesus is the object of our belief. The Word of God is not philosophy that was dreamt up by man. It wasn't something that come from the hand of man. And Scripture plainly tells us that as men were moved by the Spirit of God, by God Himself, they penned the very words of Scripture that we literally have God's character in printed form right here. And it's more than just the words of man. Therefore, we understand it is living and it is powerful because it's God. And therefore, we are persuaded in the truthfulness of this. Because the object of our belief is the Son of the living God. Because we have come to believe by Holy Spirit. No individual can believe unless the Spirit of God enable them. Unless the Spirit of God draw an individual, they cannot come into the presence of God and recognize Him as Creator and recognize the Son as the Redeemer. God enables us. Does that not speak to His love? Does that not? He doesn't trick us. But he opens our eyes and opens our heart to see the reality of the truth of who Jesus is. And because we have come to believe by Holy Spirit in the truthfulness of who Jesus is and consequently who we are in him alone, we are persuaded in the truthfulness of his words. And Jesus addressed those Jews, those individuals, and he addresses us as well. Those who believed in him. Directly teaching them that belief was not the end. Belief is not the end. As though they had arrived. Jesus leads them to the important truth that belief is a beginning. Belief is a birthing after which growth must and should follow. Because notice what he says in verse 31. To those who believe, he says, if you who believe, who are persuaded in the truthfulness of who I am, if you will continue, that word continue means to dwell. It means to endure, to be present, to remain, to stay, to live in my words, Jesus says. Then you are truly disciples of mine. So what is the mark of authentic discipleships of Christ? Jesus tells us right here, remain in his word. Remain in his word. Because belief is just the beginning. We never stop believing. The only way we can please God, the only way we can live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, Hebrews tells us, is by how? Continuing to believe. By faith. Because faith, as we look and we find in the last few chapters of John, even John 20, when Jesus comes and stands before them, it's not seeing that enables us to believe. It's believing that enables us to see. Faith is what opens our spiritual eyes and our hearts and enables us to see the truthfulness and the reality of who God is and the life-giving power of His Word to those who will embrace it obediently. And if we continue in His Word, if we continue in it, we walk in it, that we become people of the word. We're not just people who read the word. We're people of the word because we found we are relying on his word because we have found it to be true. We found it to be living. We found it to be life transforming. We found it to be the solid rock that enables us to stand when everything else is crumbling around us. I like how other translations read in verse 31. The Message Bible says it this way. If you stick with this, 
you have your version notes, you can see this, and it's on the screen for us by our team graciously putting it there. The New Century Version says it this way, if you keep obeying my teachings, the good word, if you live by what I say, the New International, if you hold to my teachings, the New King James, if you abide in my word, they all carry the same meaning. Jesus is teaching those who believe. He is teaching them. And he teaches those who believe that when faith is placed in him and a decision is made, a decision to continue in his word, Jesus says, you are set free. At that moment, by the power of God's grace, through the indwelling power of Holy Spirit, you are set free to be an authentic disciple of the kingdom of God. Simple definition of a disciple is to be, to be a follower, a learner, a student of Christ. To follow the teachings and the example of Christ. That kind of puts a different spin on discipleship, doesn't it? So this is something I hear or I come once a week to hear about. It's who I am. Why? Because daily I'm a student of who Christ is so that I can be Christ-like. Because that's God's will through His Son is that we would be transformed daily into the image of Christ. Who is the means of salvation? There is no other salvation in any other name but the name of Jesus. And Jesus says that when we hold to his word, we are freed to live responsibly. Have you ever been told that in one way or another? Maybe you're going off on a trip or going to youth camp or kids camp. Our kids are back there so I can't look at them. And maybe your mom or your dad or someone tell you, act like you got some learning. Yeah, y'all understand that South Alabama, y'all, I mean, that identifies with all of us, doesn't it? Act like you had parents that knew what they were doing and know what they're doing when they raised you. Jesus is saying here, Belief is the beginning, so when we believe in Christ and who he is, we're persuaded in the reality that he is the God-man, the only one that could come and die for our sins and be the ultimate sacrifice to redeem us back to the Father when we believe in who he is and we hold to that, that he was fully God and fully man at the same time. He had the ability to sin like you and I, yet he did not. He was faithfully obeying God at every moment moment so he could be that sinless sacrifice for us amen I know it's a truth but it's important that we hold to that because it's a truth as it has been from the time of Jesus's death that men will they want to deny but he was the God man that lived a sinless life and proved to us by the indwelling power of Holy Spirit it is possible he says, if you will believe in me and you will hold to my words, you will abide in it. You will stay there. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So Jesus says, we are freed by believing in him and through faith continuing to grow in his word. We are free to live responsibly. Responsibly. Some are of the opinion that freedom only means independence. Freedom is not only independence. Jesus clearly teaches that along with faith, which begins us on the journey of spiritual freedom, there also comes responsibility. Amen? There is responsibility for us as disciples of Christ, there cannot be continued freedom void of responsibility. We are set free from the power and the dominion of sin that we can be enabled to live responsibly in Jesus. Responsibly. The word responsibly, when we look in our English, 
dictionaries, we find that it's an adjective. And it's defined as this. A life characterized by trustworthiness, integrity, and having the necessary abilities and resources to accomplish a task. Does that not define a disciple of Christ? That is remaining in his word and growing in his word and that is living responsibly in the freedom that we've been given in Christ? That our lives should be characterized as trustworthiness. Our lives should be characterized by integrity, having the necessary abilities by God's grace, by the indwelling power of Holy Spirit and resources to accomplish the task he's given us, to live redemptively and be a witness of that redemption. That word also means a life that is able to choose between right and wrong. We know, we know by Holy Spirit what is right and what is wrong. Oh, how many of you like me have done wrong? And within a few minutes or a few seconds, sometimes we're hard-headed, maybe it's a day, but the Holy Spirit comes and he arrests us. You remember? Oh, man, I can remember one distinct moment. We were pastoring Piney Grove. And I was carrying trash out to the dumpster. I'm just telling you, I'm an image person. And I know exactly where I was. Right there where the swings, I don't know if they're still there, where the oak trees were. I remember where I stu- stepped because when I stepped, he hit me right then. He arrested me. Yeah, you remember this? Yeah, I remembered it. And I repeated right there, Lord, forgive me. A life that is able to choose between right and wrong because the spirit of truth lives within us. And we're not just acquainted with the truth, but we are divinely attached to the truth. That when we read this word, it's not just words on a printed page. It's God's word. And it becomes life given to us. It literally leaps off the page to us. Now, am I saying that every time we read the Word of God, if it doesn't happen that way, something's wrong? Well, no. Because sometimes it is a struggle. You know it? If we're honest with one another, it's a struggle. But what do we do? We keep pressing in by Holy Spirit, not by our strength. But sometimes, you know what, if you found yourself studying the Word, you had to set it aside, get on your knees and begin to pray and say, Lord, I need your help to focus. Oh, Holy Spirit, help me. You need some time in prayer so that you can come back and re-engage in the Word. Responsibility is a life that is reliable and is dependable. Jesus teaches after saving faith is placed in Him that responsible living is directly connected to one thing. Verse 31, continuing in His Word. Are we continuing in his word. For me, as a preacher, as a pastor, Scotty, Pastor Jim, the only reason I studied the word is to have a message on Sunday. The only reason I studied the word is so I can have something to give you on Wednesday. If that's the only reason I studied the word, I'm shallow. I'm shallow. No. I study the word because I realize it's knowing the truth that enables me to continue to walk in the liberty and the freedom that he's given me and enables me to live a responsible life in Christ and to testify of the truth, what God is able to do in us if we'll give him everything, everything. How about an individual that has come to God and you thought, man, that person, mm-hmm. And after they came to the Lord, what did God do? He cleaned them up just like he cleans us all up. You thought it was impossible. In fact, even the disciples even said about individuals who had money. And this is just in reference to that, trying to keep it in the context always. And then Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Look, he was talking about a literal eye of a needle, not just some little hole in a wall in Jerusalem that camels had to kneel down and walk through. I've read that, but there is no biblical context to that. Jesus was using hyperbole to get his point across. And that's why the disciple says, well, how can anybody be saved? And what did Jesus say? 
With these things, it's impossible with man. But here it is. Here's the hope. With God, what? All things, not some things. All things are possible. We cannot have, Jesus says, the freedom, but not the responsibility that comes with the freedom. We cannot have one without the other. There can be no freedom without responsibility. Freedom without responsibility is nothing more than anarchy. And God is not the author of confusion, is he? No, God brings peace. He is the author of peace. He is the author of divine order. When his divine order comes, what accompanies his divine order? Life. Genesis chapter 1 shows us that the earth, it was formless. It was void of anything. And then God brought together his divine order as I've heard. I think it was Philip that you had said this. I had you, Philip, in my gaze. And that you're upstairs, aren't you? I had you. There you are. See, I lost you. But at the men's breakfast, I believe it was, where you spoke, is, yeah, we believe in the Big Bang Theory. God spoke and it happened. It's because God in his divine order, he brings life. But freedom without responsibility is nothing more than anarchy. Freedom only comes to those who live responsibly in the word of Christ. Freedom only comes to those who live responsibly in the word of the Lord. Freedom is given to those who learn to live out what Jesus has taught. Those who want the freedom, but not the responsibility. If I want the freedom, but not the responsibility that comes with the freedom then I refuse to move beyond mere belief. And I'm not talking about heart-transforming belief. I'm just talking about a consciousness of a fact. Those who refuse to move beyond belief only end up in bondage and slavery to sin all over again. Illustration that I've found in regards to this is it's like a guitar string. A string on a guitar can be set free, right? It can be set free. But if it's released from the guitar and it doesn't have the proper tension, it's set free. What use is it to the guitar? It can't carry a tune. But a guitar string, once it's strung on the neck, it has the proper tension that it is to have depending on what note it's supposed to fulfill within those accompaniment of strings. If it's strong and it's tuned to that right tension, then what? It harmonizes. Freedom comes not in being separated from everything or everyone. Real freedom comes by being joined together in Christ. That's when we are set apart like a guitar string to fulfill our God-given purpose and we bring harmony. And purpose to the body of Christ as each part does its part. Knowing what I think about life is not as important as knowing what God says about life. Our opinions do not lead us to what is true. There's a lot of opinions. A lot of opinions, but how much conviction in the truth? If you continue in my word, then... You are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. We're free to know divine truth. We're free to know divine truth. Ravi Zacharias, the late Christian apologist and theologian, he made this statement. The reason we have 17,000 pages of the law book is because we cannot follow 10 lines on a tablet of stone. And that's nothing that, you know, that pokes fun or, or, or that somehow diminishes our, our community, but it's truth. We have all these rules and things within our law book, but the reason we have so many pages is because we cannot keep ten lines on the tablet of stone, God's word, because why? When we begin to obey God, we understand his commandments, as John said, are not burdensome, but when we walk in them, what do they actually give to us? 
freedom and liberty to live responsibly in Christ. We know right from wrong, and we have a heart to choose what is right and not as wrong, even when we're done wrong. I know that wasn't grammatically correct, but I hope you got the intent of what I said. We're free to know divine truth. It is in this relationship of belief in Christ and continuing in His Word that we are enabled to know, to know the truth. Jesus says we will know the truth. Oh man, this is incredible. This word, gnosko, in the Greek that means know, it means to perceive, to understand, to recognize, to gain knowledge, to realize, to come to know. It is the knowledge that has an inception, it has a progress, it has an attainment. It is the recognition of truth by personally experiencing it. It's not just what some professor says is true. No, we know it's truth in our hearts. Why? Because it's inside of us. It's living in us. It's not some man or woman that stands in front of us and tells us this is what you should believe. It's God's truth that he's brought into our hearts. Jesus is not talking about a superficial understanding or the mere knowledge of information. We will know the truth through a personal experience with the truth. And therefore, through belief in Christ and abiding in his word, we have been given intimate interaction with the truth that brings freedom and liberty and enables us to live responsibly. What is in, just incredible about this word no, and I pray that it impacts your heart, not because I say it, not because I say it, the Lord has said it. The Lord has. We are able to handle the truth. Handle it. It's not just something that I may know and you don't know. I can handle and you can't handle. All of us as children of God are able to handle the truth. We're able to touch it. We're able to see that it is indeed truth. Some people accuse us of having blind faith. That is not what the scripture means when it says... We walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. Jesus says we're able to handle. In other words, the truth is tangible. Amen. Have we found the truth to be tangible? Have I found the truth to be tangible? Have you found the truth to be tangible? Do we ever, as we grow in the Lord, do we find the truth to continue to be tangible? That that we're able to handle? that that we're able to see, we can literally, as the word says, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. He's gracious. I know that therefore I can't twist the truth of God's word. I can't twist his word to fit my lifestyle. There's so much twisting of God's word. I know this is a hot-button topic, and I'm, I'm not going here to condemn. Please understand my heart. It's not to condemn, but there are individuals that say that you can be a child of God. You can be a preacher of the gospel, and you can live a lifestyle of homosexuality. And there are churches in this nation, individuals that are believers, those that say that they handle the truth, that they touch the truth, that they know the truth, that say it's okay, it's okay to live with your sin because God loves you. That's not the love of God. God's love is not to allow us to live in what is killing us and to destroy us. God's love is to set us free from that. To set us free. So as we the church, should we snub our nose at these individuals and wag our finger at them and protest? Absolutely not. We need to get on our knees and we need to do spiritual warfare and we need to pray for them and ask that the truth of God's word would open their eyes and the scales would be removed as it was for Paul so that they can see the truth and they can know the truth and know the life and the freedom that comes from it. 
and they can live responsibly. God, help us. Oh, God, help us. God, help us. I'm not the greatest preacher, and I'll never say that because I know I'm not. But you know what? That's okay. God hasn't called me to be the greatest. God has just called me to be the best that I can be. And I strive each day to do that, not for you, but for him. Yes, for you in the sense that I want to preach the word. But in saying that, I want to say this. There is preaching from the pulpit that is nothing more than just touching the feelings of our emotion. Guys, you know this as well as I do as the worship team comes. God wants to enable us to live responsible lives in Christ. And we cannot twist the truth of God's word to fit our lifestyle. Because if we do that, we lose the freedom of God's word because we deny its truth. If we do this, I don't really have an intimate knowledge of the truth. Jesus is not... He's not telling us the divine truth. That's the problem as humans as we try to define the truth. God is truth. God says just hear and believe and let me bring the truth home to your heart. Don't define it. Because the truth is found in one individual, defined in one individual, and that is Jesus Christ. Truth is not something that is inquired through our intellect. Truth is not just something that we stumble upon. It is only through God's grace that we are invited to be joined into an intimate knowledge of truth through faith in Jesus Christ. As we close, can we look together Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 4. Can we begin reading at verse 17? Ephesians 4, verse 17. All right, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles. Now understand, we're Gentiles. But we understand what Paul is saying here. He's referring to individuals that are living in sin. They're not living in faith in Christ. They don't believe in Christ. As John is talking about in John 8, 30. Don't live as Gentiles. You walk no longer as the Gentiles. Also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Because it's all about self. But discipleship is all about selflessness. It's all about Christ. Verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Amen? If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in who? Jesus. That in reference to your former manner, verse 22 of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the seat, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Here it is, verse 24. Put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. The truth is singular. You look at it in the Word of God, and when it refers to truth, it always refers to truth in the singular. Why? Because it's, it's only one. And it is defined in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we look to God's Word, and as we look to what has been spoken from John chapter 8, verses 30 through 32, that it shows us that we are enabled through faith in Christ and by continually abiding in His Word, as we looked at last Sunday, abiding in Him, then we're able to live responsibly, set free from sin. So therefore, for us as believers, there is no excuses. 
no excuses in the grace that God has given us by His Son through the indwelling power of Holy Spirit. God calls and enables us to live responsibly with the freedom that He has given us by grace through His Son so that we're able to live responsibly in the truth. And here it is, not only live responsibly in the truth, but we're able to love responsibly in the truth. Live responsibly in the truth and love responsibly in the truth. So the statement that we always say, you love the sinner, but you hate the sin, is true with the right attitude. Because we understand, as God does, we understand the object that is destroying their life as it once destroyed our lives. Are we living responsibly? When you bring a message like this, Pastor Jim, Scotty, and others, you understand, okay, how is this going to flow? How's this going to come over? Because I do not want to come over as I'm pointing the finger and say, look what you're not doing, but look what I'm doing. I'm not, that's not the way I'm preaching this morning. How can people know the truth if they don't see the truth in us? Because we're to be God's witness. Are we living responsibly? This is not a call of condemnation. This is a call to walk in the life that he has given us through his son by the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit more than ever before not that we you know we make those statements and I've always wondered so it, it was less then and yet it's more now no but what I'm saying is, is when we look at the world around us more than ever before we need to realize God has called us to live responsibly to witness the truth in his word can we stand together this morning